It's time for the three question one for renal six. Let's get going. Which cytokines are produced by Th2 cells? So the Th2 cells uh, produce interleukin four and five, which uh, will lead to an activation of B cells and antibody production. Also IL-10, uh, which is gonna inhibit Th1 cells. Next question, what neurotransmitter is depleted with MPTP exposure? So the neurotransmitter is dopamine because uh, MPTP is converted to MPP, uh, which destroys those dopaminergic uh, neurons in the substantia nigra. Next question, a male patient presents with involuntary flailing of one arm. Where is the lesion? So this is hemibolismus, which is caused by a lesion of the subthalamic nucleus on the contralateral side. All right, that's it for the warm up. Let's get to that lecture now. In this video, we're going to talk about a topic that a lot of students really can't stand, acid-base disorder. I know, it's a little melodramatic. But I also know that some of you find acid-base disorders truly frightening. So I hope that after this video, you'll understand these disorders and feel pretty confident about solving acid-base problems. I'll start by talking about the kinds of things that can cause acid-base disorders, starting with acidosis. Respiratory acidosis takes place when you're hypoventilating and you're retaining CO2. So lots of things can cause hypoventilation, either acutely or chronically. Airway obstruction and air trapping, any kind of lung disease, especially interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, weak respiratory muscles, especially weakness of the diaphragm, and drugs like opioids, which suppress the respiratory drive. Metabolic acidosis occurs either because you're adding acid to the blood or because you're losing excessive bicarb. So metabolic acidosis can be further categorized based on whether there's a high anion gap or a normal anion gap. And when you add acids to the blood, that causes a high anion gap acidosis. And the mnemonic for the causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis is mud piles. Now this is definitely high yield to know. The M in mud piles is for methanol. U is for uremia or renal failure. D is for diabetic ketoacidosis. For P, I want you to remember propylene glycol. Now you may sometimes see an older drug called fenformin, which was a drug like metformin for diabetes, but it's been off the market for something like 40 years. And there's an even older chemical called peraldehyde, uh, which still has some industrial uses, but not too many medical uses anymore. So for P, don't worry about fenformin, don't worry about peraldehyde, remember propylene glycol. Then I is for two things, iron tablets and also isoniazid or INH. L is for lactic acid. Now, when are you most likely to see lactic acidosis? In a patient who's in shock or a patient who's coding. He's not perfusing his tissues very well, so lactic acid's building up. Then E is for ethylene glycol, which is found in antifreeze. So there are lots of organic acids on this list that people might drink for one dumb reason or another. Methanol, propylene glycol, ethylene glycol. And then the S in mud piles is for salicylates, like aspirin. Then for a normal anion gap acidosis, that's where you're not adding acids, but instead you're losing bicarb. So this can be from a bunch of less dramatic things like diarrhea, renal tubular acidosis, spironolactone, or acetazolamide. We're going to talk about RTA or renal tubular acidosis in just a second. Okay, so what kinds of things cause alkalosis? Well, respiratory alkalosis is when you're hyperventilating, man, you're blowing off a lot of CO2. Uh, maybe there's a psychogenic cause like anxiety or panic attack. Maybe you're at high altitude and you're starving for oxygen, so you increase ventilatory rate. Or if you have some acute hypoxemia like a PE, and that makes you hyperventilate, uh, and then you're going to blow off a bunch of CO2. And also aspirin toxicity can lead to hyperventilation. Now hold on. Didn't I just say that salicylates like aspirin cause metabolic acidosis? Why, yes. Yes, I did. The deal is that early on, if you chug a bottle of aspirin, aspirin will directly stimulate the respiratory center in the brain and cause hyperventilation. Then later, you might see some metabolic acidosis, but aspirin's a pretty weak acid. What about metabolic alkalosis? So typically this occurs when you're losing hydrogen ions some way. Uh, excessive vomiting can do it. Diuretics can do it. We talked about uh, those on, on the video on diuretics where you lose chloride and the hypochloremia results in alkalosis. And hyperaldosteronism can do it as well. So with hyperaldosteronism, you're going to see a triad of hypokalemia, hypertension, and metabolic alkalosis. Now let's talk about renal tubular acidosis. So there are three types of RTA you need to know about, and all three result in a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. 
The first one is type 1 RTA or distal RTA. Now as the name suggests, this is a defect in the distal nephron. So we're talking about the collecting tubule. Remember, we talked about the two types of intercalated cells in the collecting tubule. You have alpha cells, which secrete hydrogen, and beta cells, which secrete bicarb. Well, in type 1 RTA, the alpha intercalated cells in the collecting tubule aren't able to secrete hydrogen, which means that the hydrogen stays in the body and the patient becomes acidotic. Now, the main thing to know with this one is that the urine pH is greater than 5.5. So if you can't secrete hydrogen ions into the urine, that urine is going to become more alkaline and the urine pH is going to be high. So that's a big clue for you. The other clue is that these patients have hypokalemia. So if you have a metabolic acidosis where the urine pH is greater than 5.5 and it's associated with serum hypokalemia, you may be dealing with a type 1 RTA. Then the other type of RTA that you should know about is type 4 RTA, which is often due to hypoaldosteronism. Now, low aldosterone causes type 4 RTA. And think about it. If, if aldosterone is low, you're not putting potassium into the urine, so these patients have hyperkalemia. And that hyperkalemia prevents the collecting tubules from generating ammonium, or NH4+. And that means that uh, urine pH is going to be low. It's going to be less than 5.5. So the urine pH is appropriately low. Urine is usually acidic. And in this case, it has a normal low pH, a normal acidity. But with type 1 RTA, you're going to have higher pH urine, more alkaline urine. And that's kind of unusual. Now last year, a student sent in a very helpful mnemonic. Type 1 has to do with impaired hydrogen excretion. So the symbol for hydrogen is H, which is one letter, type 1. Type 4 has to do with impaired ammonium excretion. And the chemical formula for ammonium is NH4, NH4+. Plus. And again, type 4, NH4, type 4. And type 4 is also associated with too much aldosterone. And some people abbreviate aldosterone as ALDO. ALDO has four letters. So again, type 4 RTA. And then there's type 2 RTA, which is a proximal tubule defect affecting bicarb reabsorption. And it's associated with hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia. And again, urine pH is appropriately low. Now let's talk about how you would determine what type of acid-base disorder a patient has based on an arterial blood gas. So with an ABG, you're going to get several values. You're going to get a serum pH. You're going to get serum bicarb. You're going to get the partial pressure of oxygen. And you're going to get a partial pressure of CO2. So how do you use these numbers to determine whether you're dealing with metabolic acidosis or respiratory alkalosis or whatever? Well, for starters, there's our old friend, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. But before you start to panic, you don't have to memorize this for step one, right? All I want you to remember about the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is that pH is related to bicarb over PCO2. You don't really need to memorize the entire thing. Just know this one component of it. pH is related to bicarb over PCO2. So what happens when the patient's bicarb level rises? Think about it. Raising the bicarb is a metabolic phenomenon, right? Not respiratory, metabolic. We assume that bicarb is primarily under the control of the kidneys. So how does raising the bicarb affect the pH? It's going to raise the pH. You can also reason it out from this modified Henderson-Hasselbalch equation pH is related to bicarb over PCO2. Or you just know that bicarb is a base. So if you have more bicarb in the blood, the blood's going to be more alkaline. And the pH is going to be higher. So raising bicarb will raise the pH. So this would be a metabolic alkalosis. But what if instead of high bicarb, your patient had high CO2? So CO2 is regulated not by the kidneys, but by the respiratory system. You either hyperventilate and blow off CO2, or you hypoventilate and retain CO2. So if you hypoventilate, you start retaining CO2, CO2 in the blood is going to rise. That means that pH will decrease. Again, since pH is related to bicarb over PCO2, when PCO2 rises, the pH decreases. So this would be a respiratory acidosis. So if you look at the ABG and you figure out whether the CO2 or bicarb are higher or lower than normal, you can easily determine what disorder you're dealing with. If you have a high pH, that means there's an alkalosis. If the bicarb is high, you know that the bicarb caused that high pH. That would be a metabolic alkalosis. If you have a low PCO2, you know that the low PCO2 is what caused the high pH. So that would be a respiratory alkalosis. Now, we've mentioned this before, but if you have a primary alkalosis, your body's going to try to correct that or compensate for that. For example, if you're at high altitude, oxygen tension is low, so you start hyperventilating, trying to oxygenate. 
that's going to lead to a primary respiratory alkalosis because you're blowing off CO2. So your body's going to try to compensate for that alkalosis by excreting bicarb in the urine. That's compensation. Or if you had a patient with metabolic acidosis from DKA, they're going to be hyperventilating to blow off CO2 and try to raise the pH. That's why DKA patients have Kuzmal breathing. They're trying to compensate. But here's the big clue. A compensatory mechanism should never bring the pH all the way back into the normal range. If you start looking at the ABG and you notice that the PCO2 is out of whack and the bicarb is out of whack, but the pH is normal, that's not simply a case of really good compensation. Compensation should never bring the pH all the way back to normal. If the pH is normal, but the PCO2 and the bicarb are both out of whack, you're probably dealing with a mixed disorder, where you have both a primary metabolic acidosis and a primary respiratory alkalosis, or whatever. Now clinically, we use something called Winter's formula to estimate what the PCO2 should be in cases of metabolic acidosis, based on the expected respiratory compensation. And if the actual PCO2 is way off from what you expect using Winter's formula, then you know there must be a mixed disorder instead of just compensation. But again, just like I said you don't need to memorize the entire Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, I don't know that Winter's formula is terribly high yield for step one. I don't think you should bother memorizing it for this test. Now it is high yield for step two. It's very useful in the ICU when you're managing these patients, but for step one, I don't think you need to know it. So, confused yet? I know this stuff is difficult to conceptualize. The best way to master these acid-base problems is with some practice. So take a look at number four and number five in your study guide. Number four is the normal reference values, and then number five is a big table of practice problems we're going to work through together. So on number four, pH is 7.35 to 7.45. For PCO2, you just remove the seven, so the normal PCO2 is 35 to 45. Normal PO2 should be about double the PCO2, so normal PO2 is greater than 90. Then the normal bicarb is about half of the PCO2. I usually remember 22 to 24 for bicarb. So those are your normal gas values. Now let's look at number five. For each of these ABGs we have listed, I want you to be able to determine what the acid-base disorder is. So the first one, the pH is 7.4, and that's normal. Bicarb is 23, and that's normal. And then the PCO2 is 40, which is also normal. So what type of acid-base disorder is this? Well, this is normal. There's no disorder here. The next one, pH is 7.5. So it's 7.5 pH high or is it low? It's high, right? So you're dealing with an alkalosis. You know that right off the bat. Now, which of the other two variables is causing the alkalosis? Is it CO2 or is it bicarb? Well, the bicarb is 35, which is high. So does high bicarb cause alkalosis? Yes. And we said the bicarb is controlled by the kidneys, not by the lungs. So this is a metabolic alkalosis rather than a respiratory alkalosis. But we haven't yet determined what's going on with the PCO2 or the respiratory component. So let's see what's going on there. Here you have a PCO2 of 42, and that's in the normal range. So you know this is a pure metabolic alkalosis without any compensation. Now let's look at the next one. pH is 7.33, which is low. So this is an acidosis. So what's causing the acidosis? Well, the bicarb is 13, and that's also low. So here you have a metabolic acidosis. But what's going on with the PCO2? PCO2 is low, and that should be raising the pH. But here the pH is actually low. So did this low CO2 raise the pH back into the normal range? No. So this is a classic example of metabolic acidosis with some respiratory compensation. Let's do one more of these together, and then I'm going to let you try the rest of them on your own. So the next one says pH of 7.42. Again, that's normal. But bicarb of 32 is high. Now, a high bicarb would suggest that there's a metabolic alkalosis. And the PCO2 is 64, which is pretty high. And that should lower the pH. So is this a case of compensation? Well, again, the pH here is normal. And we said that compensation will not completely correct the pH. So this must be a mixed disorder, because both the PCO2 and the bicarb are messed up. But the pH is normal. So this is a combined metabolic alkalosis and respiratory acidosis. They're completely independent of one another. They just happen to be canceling each other out so that the pH ends up in the normal range. So that's basically how you do these. Now I want you to pause the video and try to complete the rest of this table as best you can, then I'll go through them with you. Now don't spend more than three or four minutes on it, maybe five minutes. You can always come back and work on these later. Don't spend too much time. Just go through these as quickly as you can, and then restart the video. All right, let's go through these. We left off at pH of 7.2, bicarb 18, PCO2 is 40. 
So this is metabolic acidosis without compensation. The next one, pH 7.2, bicarb 24, PCO2 54. This is a respiratory acidosis without compensation. The next one with a pH of 7.52 is respiratory alkalosis without compensation. The next one, pH of 7.66, is a combined metabolic and respiratory alkalosis. The next one, pH 7.47, is a respiratory alkalosis with metabolic compensation. The next one, pH 7.46, is a metabolic alkalosis with respiratory compensation. The next one, pH 7.39, is a mixed metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. So again, it's a mixed disorder rather than metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation because the pH is in the normal range. Again, compensation shouldn't be able to get the pH back to the normal range. The next one, pH 7.34, uh, is a respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation. And then the last one, pH 7.10, is a combined metabolic and respiratory acidosis. All right, I hope you have a pretty good feel of how to do those. If not, keep practicing. We're going to have a few more of these in the end of session quiz. And if you have specific questions or need more help with this, feel free to hit me up on Twitter and I'll try to steer you in the right direction. Now let's go ahead and work through the end of session quiz, and then we'll go over the answers. All right, first question. What are the causes of acidosis with elevated anion gap or high anion gap acidosis? So we're talking about metabolic acidosis here. And our mnemonic is mud piles. So you have methanol, uremia, DKA, propylene glycol, I is for iron tablets and also isoniazid, L is for lactic acidosis, uh, then you have ethylene glycol, and the S is for salicylates. Next, for each set of ABG values, determine the acid base disorder. So the first one, pH 7.24, bicarb 24, PCO2 53, is a pure respiratory acidosis. The next one, pH 7.58, is a combined metabolic alkalosis and respiratory alkalosis. The next one with pH of 7.23 is a pure metabolic acidosis. And the last one, pH of 7.33, is a respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation. And our last question, a patient with a history of kidney stones presents with hypokalemia and metabolic acidosis. The anion gap is normal. Urine pH is 5.7. So what's the underlying defect? So this is a patient with renal tubular acidosis, right? but you have to know which type of RTA the patient has in order to figure out what the defect is. So hypokalemia could be associated with either type 1 RTA or type 2 RTA, but only type 1 RTA has the higher urine pH, greater than 5.3. So this is a type 1 RTA. So what's the defect in type 1 RTA? Again, type 1, one letter, hydrogen. So the defect is impaired secretion of hydrogen ions by the alpha intercalated cells in the collecting tubule. So that's it for Renal 6. I'll see you next time. Hey there, kiddos. Carl the Cow here. Yay! Hey, do you kids know what else cows make? No, not milk. I'll give you a little hint. You want to be careful where you step. That's right, mud piles. Yay! Mud piles also stand for the causes of anion gap acidosis. Methanol, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, peraldehyde, isoniazid, or iron tablets, lactic acidosis, ethylene glycol, and salicylates. What, would you kids rather me make a balloon animal? Well, sorry, they don't have a clown class in med school. Happy birthday, Amber. <laughs>